Hey, mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm spending some time with a delightful edible mushroom called Maripilus simsteniae. It is not everybody's favorite mushroom to eat. That includes me, but I am going to make a uh, spicy sort of um, teriyaki jerky with this mushroom. And as you can see, this is just a spectacular fruiting. Uh, you know, even though it is not really huge, a lot of these individual little fronds of the mushroom are nice and tender. And so uh, when they're marinated uh, and, you know, dried out, they'll make a very nice jerky, uh, especially because they have some sort of comparable characteristics to, um, you know, a, a meat type product. You have sort of a nice stringy texture, but it is also um, sort of fleshy. And so it uh, does things like jerky relatively well. Let me have a sip here. Okay, so Maripilus sumsteniae uh, is commonly called the black, black staining polypore. And that is a very apt name. It's just a really straightforward description of the fruiting, the fruiting body's form, which is a polypore. And so it means it's got a porous uh, undersurface. So no gills or blade-like things, no teeth, uh, no sponge. It's just this uh, sort of smooth layer that um, has very small pores in it. So that's the polypore part. And then the black staining part is that when you damage this mushroom very rapidly, you get a really, really dark brown black stain uh, on the fruiting body. And that's kind of the entire mushroom. If you handle it that way, uh, it will start to stain for you. Um, the polypores that are sort of similar morphologically or, you know, in general appearance to these mushrooms are all uh, edible. And so basically the mushrooms that we have that are, uh, you know, fleshy and uh, polyporous, and then also are uh, sort of this like feathery or fronded appearance. There's a lot of really good beginner mushrooms in that area. So we have uh, chicken of the woods and the latiparous genus, and there's several species of those. Uh, you have Griffola frondosa, which is hen of the woods, and one of the most um, favorite, one of my most favorite is mushrooms that comes out in the fall. It's sort of the last hurrah of the, uh, you know, southeastern uh, U.S. mushroom season, and uh, actually in the northeast too, but it just happens a little earlier for them usually, but it's like the last big, really desirable edible mushroom that starts to fruit is uh, hen of the woods. And then uh, akin to this mushroom in appearance, is a tan mushroom called Bandarzoea berkeleyi or Berkeley's polypore. I don't know if I'm saying Bandarzoea properly, but I just like hollering it out, bellowing it uh, like it's a war cry or something. But anyway, it is a mushroom that sort of fruits around the same time as Maripilus sumsteniae. It does not stain, but it has a very similar color. Uh, and it's so, it's sort of a creamy tan. This is a really light colored uh, specimen of Maripilus. And so this is more creamy than uh, like a, a sort of I don't know, a fawn color. Uh, this is a little bit more representative of how they look sometimes. So um, what you have with, uh, you know, Maripilus substeniae, substeniae, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep going. I just got back actually from camping with some mushroom friends of mine. And uh, a few of those folks are much more experienced than I am. And so we had a lot of conversations about what kind of Latin do you speak? And my Latin is sort of this pigeon of, I know a couple of rules of pronunciation. I also absorb from the community and a lot of my uh, pronunciation is totally bogus and erroneous because these are words I have read, but words I have not spoken. And so, you know, the online mushroom community is wonderful in a lot of ways, uh, but, you know, it is a text-based community. So a lot of the time when you get together with people, there's um, sort of a meta conversation. So you do mushroom identification, you talk about the taxonomy, and then you talk about whose pronunciation is likelier to be closest to the intended, you know, Greek or uh, uh, Latin root. But anyway, um, so I'm going to return to my identification. But 
Uh, I really enjoyed um, Adam Boring. He is a mycologist who is just lovely. And he said, you know, when I teach mushroom classes, I tell people, you're going to get the hillbilly Latin. And of course, you know, his pronunciation far outstrips mine. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun way to think about and caveat your knowledge of like, I know how to read these things, absorb these things. If I can't pronounce it, well, I don't live in ancient Greece and I don't live in Rome. So I suppose that's probably okay. Um, um, anyway, to return to Meropilus sumsteniae and also Bandarozoea berkeleyi, uh, you have this sort of tan polyporous fruiting body. The other thing that is really common with these mushrooms is sort of these like fronded feathery uh, rosette appearance. And at, uh, in the case of Meropilus, it is a wood decomposer. And in this case, it's growing at the base of a very large dead oak tree. And so this mushroom can sometimes appear, and most of the time actually appears terrestrial, meaning it is growing on the ground, but it's growing on the ground in very close prox proximity to a huge source of woody material, and it's probably on the root system decomposing it. So uh, you'll see that also with um, Latiparus cincinnatus, that is the sort of uh, most common chicken of the woods species and definitely from my perspective the most likely to be good to eat uh, that I see pretty regularly and it is again a wood decomposer but you often will see it uh, growing in these sort of big rosettes uh, bit and in the case of uh, chickens they're you know bright pinky color with white undersurfaces but you have this sort of similar fruiting pattern but it is important to note that they are decomposers as opposed to um, you know mycorrhizal because that uh, and mycorrhizal is like they're symbiotes and they are growing in association with a living tree uh, that decomposing lifestyle kind of helps you with identification but um all right so to return uh one last time to features for this mushroom i'm gonna go ahead and harvest the big boy i've been waiting this is the moment of truth and also if oh we got we got a saw a little bit here all right so um as you can see, uh, you know, the fronds have a little bit of uh, lumpiness and bumpiness, oftentimes in the inner sort of growth circle. You can expect the outer zones to be the most tender. So a lot of these mushrooms, as they grow, the outer surface is the, you know, the latest layer that the mushroom has added. And you can see these bands of growth zones. And so often, you know, the inside of the mushroom, or as you could hear, I was like sawing through the base. This part down here, I'm just gonna chop off and leave behind. Behind. Uh, but I'm going to take the fronds that are soft enough that, you know, when I soak them, they will absorb, uh, you know, my teriyaki and red pepper uh, soup or marinade to make my jerky. Um, the aroma is fungal. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit sweet, but it, it's not super pungent. Uh, Bandarzoea berkeleyi, Berkeley's polypore, uh, you know, looks almost uh, identical to this. It doesn't tend to be quite as dark uh, and also lacks that lumpiness and bumpiness on its inner, uh, you know, the inner layer very frequently. So it's sort of a more fan-shaped dude and a little bit less, uh, you know, uh, standing up straight. Uh, and of course it does not stain black, but um, it has the same uh, tendency as far as uh, its growth pattern, but it sometimes has a fairly unpleasant aroma. Uh, and I, that's one of the reasons that I don't tend to eat that mushroom frequently. But a lot of people, like I had some jerky with uh, Bandar Zawiya Berkeley Eye in it, and it was pretty delicious. So, you know, take all that I say with a grain of salt. I am uh, oftentimes lazy and I'm not very creative in the kitchen. And so there is uh, the delight of mushroom hunting and then the culinary side of it. And I cross that bridge regularly but I cross via a far less like elaborate and uh, beautiful fashion than some of the people who are you know truly know how to treat these mushrooms in a way that they will be uh, tasty oh I've got a giant I'm gonna show you a giant beetle this is a, oh no he fell off okay well this mushroom was getting uh, a giant beetle crawling all over him so it was it was pretty dramatic there and now he looks perplexed but I'm not gonna fiddle with him further 
Uh, so, you know, the black staining is really the thing you want to look for. Uh, despite their sort of decomposing habit, you can expect these mushrooms to recur as long as they have something to decompose. And since I'm looking at a giant dead oak tree, uh, you know, I've been collecting this mushroom here for several years, and I would not expect that to slow down or stop at any time soon. Um, so that's what I have for you in that, uh, that species. I also want to talk about chanterelles briefly. So I have a few different, uh, well, I, I think I have two separate chanterelle species represented here. This one, uh, is I'm almost certain. And when I say almost certain, this is produced from a patch that I've gotten, uh, the lion's share of people who are very experienced agree with me that this is the, um, peachy chanterelle. So, uh, excuse me, cantharellus persicinus is the uh, scientific name here. And then this mushroom is, um, and again, from these same conversations over a couple of years with people, cantharellus velutinus. And this uh, mushroom can very frequently have pinky tones to it. And so the question of like, which, which uh, chanterelle is which is trivial from an edibility perspective, but it's always interesting to observe the difference between a mushroom that can have pinky tones. And this one, if you look uh, under the cap, uh, with the, um, you know, false gills, and that's a, that's a really uh, distinctive feature for Cantharellus, the chanterelle genus. Uh, so, you know, they're just sort of these wrinkles. And even though the mushroom is an orangey color, you can get little uh, bits of a, a pinky hint here. And I think, oh, here's one that even shows it a little bit more, I think. So like toward the end of these uh, forked and uh, non-deep sort of wrinkly false gills, you have a little bit of a pinkish or um, peachy blushing going on. In the case of Cantharellus persicinus, you have a mushroom that on the cap is actually far more pink. And so, uh, you know, with Velutinus, my experience with it is it's a really orangey mushroom typically, but some of them have these like peach tones to one degree or another. Whereas this little fella is really, really quite pink and more pink on the cap than underneath, which is the other way around with Velutinus. So uh, additionally, this is just a much smaller and daintier species overall. And so, you know, the mushrooms, they can get a little bit larger and they tend to also, I see this patch fruit a good bit into the fall when um, the, you know, our other larger mushrooms in this patch have uh, gone to sleep for the year. Um, really quickly on cleaning chanterelles when you collect them, I cannot uh, stress enough how nice it is to have nice clean mushrooms when you get home. So trim off your bases unless you are collecting it to, you know, take home and identify. But like if you're going to eat it, then trim it and brush it off really good. And you will, uh, you will thank yourself for doing that because it's very exciting and a, and a lot of fun to pick mushrooms really fast, especially if you're in a patch that is just very abundant. And I've done that way too many times. And then I get home and I'm cleaning mushrooms forever. It is so much easier to get a mushroom clean when you first collected it than it is after that dirt has had a time, you know, time to get mashed together as you're sort of flailing around in the woods as I tend to do. So it's not a matter of like, do it now or later. It's like, if you do it now, it is a lot easier than doing it later when you get home. All right, I've gone on at great length, but you know, in conclusion, I think Meropilus somsteniae and uh, Bondarza wea berkeleyi, the Latiparus chicken of the woods mushrooms and hen of the woods griffrilla frondosa, like that is a cluster of species that you really ought to get to know, especially if you are a casual mushroom hunter or hobbyist and you just want to be able to be like, ha ha, free gourmet food from the forest floor. Uh, those are mushrooms that they're very easy to identify. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure we'll have uh, additional taxonomy and genetic work on them um, over the course of time. So names may change, all that fun stuff. But nonetheless, their, uh, their edibility is durable. Uh, and I think that you'll find it worth exploring whether or not they're to your taste.